Yes, we are coming to you live from our studios right here at the Kampala Serena Conference Center Hotel. Hello there, very good morning and many thanks for joining us for yet another exhilarating edition of Morning at NTV. My name is Roman Busik, of course, I'm bigger, back and better on this number one platform that is due towards acquainting you with that information that you need to conquer your day, conquer your week, vis-a-vis -vis conquer your careers. And of course, the invasion of Ukraine is on day five. The Russian forces are not relenting. The letters that we are getting from Ukraine indicates that one night eight people have actually died so far and we are still counting out of that number we're talking about 4,300 Russians who have also died within this invasion that started on Thursday that is last week now three out of the 198 fatalities within Ukraine are children that is the latest information we are getting right here the EU closed its airspace yes they are barring Russian warplanes from actually using its airspace, its airspace to invade Ukraine in that regard we also do know that there are intentions to actually block the swift uh, bank messaging app within uh, russia in that regard sputnik media Russia today, that is RT, are no longer being allowed to operate within the European uh, space. That is the latest coming in right here on Morning at 10 TV. What else do we know? The coronavirus pandemic is not relenting anytime soon. We are talking about 435 million cases of COVID-19 being registered on the whole global stage. Out of that number, 366 million people have recovered, meaning we have some 69 million active cases on the global stage in that regard. The U.S. is taking the biggest chunk of all those cases as usual, 80.5 million cases of COVID-19 have been registered and over 900,000 people have died within the U.S. Second most bad country has to be, that is India. 42.9 million plus cases have been registered. We also do know that 500,000 people and counting have died within India. 
third most battered country. It has to be Brazil. 28.7 million plus cases of COVID-19 have been registered and over 600,000 people are no longer with us as a result of those infections. Then you do have France with 22.6 million. You do have the United Kingdom with 18.8 million plus cases of COVID-19. You do have the Russians grappling with some 16 million. You do have Germany with 14 million, Turkey 14 million. You also do have Italy with around uh, some 14 uh, 12 million cases of COVID-19 and Spain finally with some 10 million cases of COVID-19. Off to South Africa, the African country grappling the most with COVID-19. 3.6 million plus cases of COVID-19 have been registered. Right here in Uganda, 163,250 cases of COVID-19 have also been registered. 3,588 people are no longer with us since getting infected with this novel heinous coronavirus disease. If you look at the DRC, 85,000 cases have been registered. If you look at Rwanda, some 129,000 cases have been registered. If you look at Tanzania, 33,000 cases have been registered. Somalia, uh, some 29,000 cases have been registered. Egypt, yes, they are grappling. 468,000 cases have been registered. Around 400,000 cases have also been registered within Ethiopia. Northern Sudan, that is Khartoum, 61,000 cases have been registered of the coronavirus disease. So as the pandemic continues to rage, so are militia men and other strong men who are still wearing their very ugly ahead like I did mention with the events unraveling within the area of Ukraine. The United Nations General Assembly will be actually holding a special sitting today to actually iron out a few deliberations on what is happening within Ukraine. So far, 198 people have died, three of whom are children. 4,300 Russians have also been actually killed within the invasion in Ukraine. They actually tried to take over the second largest city of Kharkiv, that is on Sunday yesterday. But then, thanks to the work of the volunteers and the Ukrainian army that put up a contracted fight. We also do know that they stopped the Russian invaders from entering the second city of Kharkiv. However, the Russians are making gains in the south of Ukraine. We are talking about the areas surrounding Badyansk and also Kherson. These are areas that are close to the area of Crimea, which was actually annexed by Russia, that is in 2014. As we veer with this uh, morning show, shortly I'll be acquainting you with more information pertaining to what is happening with Ukraine. But as is tradition on this morning show let's acquaint you with this fit in five segment whereby you get to resuscitate your body's constitution good morning and welcome to morning at ntv good morning viewers it's a tough day again we'll be showing you some exercises you can be doing at home today is cardio um you can just do this at home get fit very fast and you can find me on my social media pages alt lifestyle on all of them instagram youtube Twitter, Facebook, and Snapchat. Okay, we're going to begin off with fast fit. So I just want you to do a bit of a bend, a bit of a squat, and go as fast as you can. Keep that bend. Okay. Go as fast as you can, keep breathing in and out as you go very fast. Okay. Next we're going to do, we're going to do a skip. So if you have a rope, you can use a rope. If you don't, mimic the jumping rope motion. So just. Next one, it's on the floor, so you're going to use your arms a bit here. Plus your shoulder above your palm. Be very firm. Come in, then go back to a plank. Next one is also down again, a plank variation. So remember planking jumps? I mean plank jumping jumps like this. We're going to do this version in a plank form. So be firm, be as firm as you can, stay in the plank and do your jumps. You can go from 10 to 40 reps.
Okay, remember, remember to stay in your plank form as much as you can. Okay. We're doing pivoting uppercuts. In this one, squat as deep as you can and come back. Okay. If your knees are not yet up there, you can just do a shallow squat and then the uppercut. Another squat variation. So I want you to squat and do jumping jacks while in a squat. That's basically it. Just squat and do your jacks. Remain in the squat. Then come up. Feel your thighs. Get strained, but keep keep going. Okay. Going to do mountain climbers. So the best ones to do are cross ones. So bring the opposite leg to the opposite elbow, like this. So let's start. One, two, three. Okay, our last one, we're going to do burpees. This, I encourage you to do even over 50. They are good for your the entire body. Okay, we start off with a jump. Then go down. Go into a plank. And back. Do you get that? Jump. Go down. And back. So you can go as slow or as fast as you want. It's to five. we had for today hope you enjoyed that as usual find me on all my social media pages for nutrition and fitness tips you're watching morning at ntv how amazing is that? A full body resuscitation in under five minutes. Now that is fit in five with the Tambalakeli. Such workouts will go a long way in helping you alleviate the harmful impacts of the COVID-19 pathogens when they actually invade your body's constitution. Away from that, we also do have news that is breaking on the horizon and on the international scene and we'd like to keep our viewers in the know. The next segment, while they were asleep, will now take us to Ukraine. That is where Russia has invaded uh, the country. The United Nations Security Council voted on Sunday a rare emergency special session on the General Assembly to discuss Russia's attack on Ukraine. The meeting will be convened that is today on Monday and is set to give all 193 members of the global body the opportunity to express their views on the invasion. Russia voted against the resolution but under UN regulations it did not have veto power to derail the referral of the war to the General Assembly. The procedure is allowed under a 1950 resolution called Uniting for Peace. It allows for members of the Security Council to seize the General Assembly for a specialization if the five permanent members, that is Russia, the United States, Britain, France and China, fail to agree among themselves to act together to maintain peace. The move was packed by Russia on Friday using its veto to block a Security Council resolution that condemned Moscow's invasion and called for the immediate withdrawal of its troops from Ukraine. Only the support of the nine of the Council's 15 members is required to call an emergency specialization of the General Assembly. Eleven countries voted in favor, Russia opposed, while the United Arab Emirates, UAE, China and India actually decided to abstain. 
It will be the 11th such session that the Assembly has held according to the diplomats. The discussion is expected to highlight the extent of Russia's isolation in the international community over the, Russian Im over the Ukraine invasion. Monday's session is scheduled to start at around 10 a.m. in New York, that is around 1,500 GMT, and is expected to last at least all day. On Monday, the Security Council is scheduled to hold at least uh, around 5 p.m. an emergency meeting on the humanitarian situation within Ukraine. It was requested by French President Emmanuel Macron and will feature officials from the United Nations, humanitarian air affairs and refugee agencies, according to the diplomats. That is the latest pertaining the Russia uh, invasion of Ukraine in that regard. The rest that we do know is that since Thursday of last week, over 400,000 Ukrainians have actually crossed over into Poland and other nations neighbors that are surrounding Ukraine in that regard as a result of this uh, incursion of the Russian military forces in that regard. We also do know 198 civilians have died, three of whom are children. But on the other side of Russia, they've also lost so many soldiers. 4,300 soldiers on the Russian side have also died in that regard. And according to the European Union, over 7 million people have been displaced within Ukraine. That is since 2014 in that regard. Let's move on to other contestations surrounding this debacle within Ukraine. The European Union that is on Sunday vowed to coordinate a welcome for hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians fleeing the Russian invasion, talking notably about offering them temporary protection status. Around 400,000 Ukrainians have crossed into the EU since the start of the offensive that is on Thursday last week, according to an AFP tally. Half of them entered Poland, its government said. A meeting of EU interior ministers raised the possibility of giving Ukrainians status under an as yet unused 2001 temporary protection di directive that would allow them to live and work in the EU for up to three years, in quotes. A very big majority of ministers were in favor of rapidly activating that option, said French Interior Minister Gerard Damanin, whose country holds the rotating EU pre presidency. <coughs> Under cooperation agreements, Ukrainians with passports bearing biometric data are allowed to enter the EU without a visa and stay for up to three months. What else do we know? <coughs> But the EU Home Affairs Commissioner, that is Ilva Johansson, said the bloc needed to be ready to host them beyond that duration and that it needed to prepare for potentially millions of arrivals, that is, from Ukraine. The directive was originally drawn up for refugees from the conflicts that racked the former Yugoslavia with provisions for handling a massive inflow of people and measures to distribute them across the EU's 27 nations. Belgium was on the forefront of the member states calling for the protection directive to be applied. And at this historical moment, we need to take the right decision in quotes, taking the right decision means the temporary protection directive being put in place, Belgian Immigration Minister Sami Mahmi said. For the tool to be used, though, a qualified majority of EU states, 15 of the 27 countries, representing a total of at least 65% of the bloc's population, need to bark it. <coughs> And of course, also pertaining to this situation, we also do know that the European Union is going to be leveling a barrage of sanctions on Belarus. This is a country that allowed the, uh, that is the Russian uh, troops to actually enter Ukraine using its borders, meaning Alexander Lukashenko is also in hot soup. But he's also the same man that is expediting talks between Ukraine and also the Russian counterparts in that regard. On the side of the Ukrainian officials, President Volodymyr Zelensky is saying he doesn't think a lot is going to come out of the talks with the, with Russia to begin with, but he says he's highly optimistic and he says the talks should go on. So we are looking ahead to those uh, deliberations taking center stage and we shall be able to relay that information in a verified manner. So that's it for the international news. Let's get into sports news with LV Seneno. He joins me right now on set. A very good morning, my dear comrade. It's been a long time coming. How have you been doing? Uh, good morning, Romeo. <laughs> yes, it's been quite long. Indeed. But, uh, well, plenty. Um, uh, unfolding in the world of sports. Russia is being threatened from being banned from World Cup 2022. What mm -hmm. do you make of this and a lot more in this sphere of sports where we do have many of the um, sports athletes and also the fans in that regard actually mm -hmm. showing solidarity mm -hmm. for the people of Ukraine? What do you make of all this? Well, um, it's two way for me. Um, like you stated um, mm -hmm. last evening or this morning, depending on which uh, continent you're residing Indeed. Uh, there is that communication from FIFA mm -hmm. where they indicate that um, Russia will still go ahead and uh, feature in the World Cup qualifiers they're due to mm -hmm. feature in the playoffs of the World Cup qualifiers mm -hmm. and uh, the country they're supposed to play that is Poland 
have already indicated that they do not intend to play that game. Now, for and me, you wouldn't blame them. Okay. Well, I think refusing to play doesn't it worsen the situation? Mm -hmm. um, we've seen Sport uniting, um, um, uniting uh, so many of these factions mm -hmm. um, uh, glo globally. I'll give the example of um, Ivory Coast. Mm -hmm. If you remember, in, in the lead up to the 2006 World Cup, uh, when Ivory Coast qualified for the World Cup for the first time, and uh, the players uniting because at the time uh, there are players who are coming from two different parts of Ivory Coast. I see. Some from South Ivory Coast, others from uh, North Ivory Coast. Mm. And some of the notable names included, say, DJ Drogba, who came from the South. And uh, that was um, predominantly supported by the then president, mm. Ivorian president, Laurent Bagbo. Mm. And then the North had some other prominent names like the Toure brothers, Kolo Toure mm. and Yaya Toure. So in the lead up to the final World Cup qualifier game, uh, they are okay, it was dramatic and all. Um, uh, rather, every course qualifying mm -hmm. after there was uh, a draw between the two teams that were supposed to compete with them. Mm -hmm. So, in the immediate aftermath, in the dressing room <coughs> during the celebrations, mm -hmm. the then Ivorian captain DJ Drogba gets the microphone, gets the microphone, uh, calls in uh, the TV guys, and uh, passes on a message. In that period, mm -hmm. everyone forgot about the, the, the civil war mm -hmm. between the north and the south, and mm -hmm. there was some sort of unity. And later, during a World Cup qualifier against Madagascar, um, again, uh, DJ Drogba did what was um, unthinkable at the time. That was um, asking for their World Cup qualifier game against Madagascar mm -hmm. to be played in Northern Ivory Coast. And uh, DJ came from, uh, south, from the south, uh, th southern part of Ivory Coast. So they held the game. The game was played in Northern um, Ivory Coast. And uh, there was a uh, seizing of fire at the time. That's how strong powerful sport can be uh, in the world so for me in that regard i'd rather uh, the game is played instead of shunning russia mm. allow the russians to participate in mm. that regard and use sports as a platform to actually denounce what is happening in ukraine yeah um, yes this might, it might be very difficult and everyone mm. feel, feels hard done by by uh, what russia has done Indeed. but for me not playing only what's in the situation mm. get on with it as um actually as uh, actually as mm. events unfold we're also now learning that uh, there could actually be uh, some sort of truce or some sort of mm. seizing fire between the two parties and mm. then we might have um, uh, two, the two parties, that is Ukraine and Russia, sitting mm. down on the table and then having negotiations and uh, having this done peacefully. So, so for now, the uh, meantime, Elvis, I don't know, they were banned from holding the St. Petersburg mm. League Cup final, indeed, and there's also threats to actually mm. have them <coughs> being banned from the World Cup 2020. No, wh what, what, uh, what do you make of, of all that? Yes, like you stated, the Champions League mm. was supposed to be played in St. Petersburg in mm. Russia. Mm. That is the hometown of uh, the Russian president, indeed. Vladimir Putin. Uh, that has since changed. It's been transferred to France, mm -hmm. the Champions League final. Yes, that is understandable because the, um, there is no safety at the moment um, mm -hmm. in Russia. You're not too sure about the players or the team's safety mm -hmm. when the Champions League will be played, even mm -hmm. though it will be in May. So it is understandable for safety purposes okay. that uh, the Champions League is being moved. But uh, while well, refusing to play the World Cup qualifiers, they are due at um, the end of uh, March, that is next month, mm. I still want to, I would want um, the action to go ahead. But like you stated, uh, um, both three countries uh, that are in line to play Russia mm. in the World Cup qualifiers already indicating that uh, they are not comfortable uh, playing against the Russians. Although it, w it is also a punish, it would be a further punishment uh, for people who are not really that involved. Um, uh, in the decision making mm. of uh, Russia attacking Ukraine. Uh, there you have it, obviously, I don't know with the rest in the world of sport, <coughs> but then some other political experts are saying isolation is the way to go. Mm. Let's go ahead with the latest in the world of sport. Yes, um, uh, plenty is happening away from uh, what is obviously affecting us. By the way, we have um, a national team player, mm. that is Farouk Mir, who plays his trade in Ukraine, plays for FC Lviv, mm. but he's since managed to leave the country and uh, is in England at the moment, but uh, he left on Saturday evening, managed to leave Ukraine. Uh, he turns out for a Ukrainian club, FC Lviv, in the top flight division. So s that uh, some of the news that mm -hmm. uh, might be associated with Ugandans uh, living in uh, Russia Indeed. and um, Ukraine. But away from that, uh, quickly switching attention to the badminton, uh, that is domestically, before I head inter to the international news yesterday, the Uganda International Badminton Open concluded at uh, the Lugogo Indoor Stadium and Uganda managed to scoop at least two bronze medals. Uh, that was uh, in the ladies' doubles, Fadila Shamika, uh, as well as uh, Tracy Naluoza in the ladies' doubles, losing in the semi-final, but uh, they were granted 
a bronze medal. Also, Israel won Agaria and uh, Gladys Zimbabwe were also eliminated at uh, the semi final stage of uh, the Uganda International Open. The tournament follows up on the African Senior Badminton Championship that was also held at Lugogo. That was last week. And uh, Uganda again managed to get a number of medals. Uh, Brian Kassidye in the main singles uh, got a bronze medal, as well as uh, Husna Kovugabe and Fadila Shamika also got bronze medals. That was uh, in the Africa Badminton Championship that uh, was held at Lugogo. And uh, those three, that is Kassidye, Husna Kovugabe, and Fadila Shamika have been nominated by the Real Star Sports Awards for the best player uh, of the month in um, the game of badminton. And uh, there are also several other nominations in the other sporting disciplines, including um, the duo of uh, Innocent Gokto and Joachim Kisano, uh, curiously named after the former Mozambican president. Uh, these two turn out for heathens, uh, who are the leaders currently in the Nile Special Rugby Premiership. The two have been nominated alongside uh, Nelson Mandela of Rams uh, for the best rugby player of the month. That is um, from the nominations of the Real Star Sports Awards. In athletics, Jacob Kiplimo, Halima Nakai, and Marcel Nchelangat are the three nominees from the athletics world, while Najib Yiga, Nafia Nalionzi, and Yun Sentamu were nominated uh, on the football side uh, for the Real Star Sports Awards for the monthly accolade um, uh, of February. Uh, their exploits, especially Najib Yiga, has played um, a very good part for Vipers. Uh, he also actually scored over the weekend in the Stanbic Uganda Cup as um, Vipers progressed uh, to the round of 16. And so he's also got a couple of goals in the league. So you think he will be in the running there for the footballer of the month in the Real Star, uh, Real Star Sports Awards uh, that uh, will be held uh, later today. Quickly switching attention uh, to the international news. I'll start with that uh, EFL Cup final or the Carabao Cup final played yesterday an eventful goalless draw played out between Chelsea and Liverpool over 120 minutes. Eventually, that game being decided on penalties or through a penalty shootout, and Liverpool were crowned EFL champions after winning 11-10. Chelsea making um, a late decision uh, to bring on the goalkeeper, Kepa Ariza Balaga. He'd kept goal for Chelsea in all the previous rounds of the competition that is uh, in the EFL Cup, but uh, the Chelsea manager, Thomas Tuchel, surprisingly dropping him uh, for... Edward Mendy, uh, the Senegalese goalkeeper, and at uh, the stroke of, uh, at the end of extra time, uh, eventually Chelsea deciding that uh, Kepa Ariza Balaga, uh, who'd served um, penalties earlier this season, uh, was a better option as they went into the shootout. And uh, unfortunately for Chelsea and uh, Kepa Ariza Balaga, he was the only player to miss in that shootout as uh, Liverpool won 11-10. So that is a decision that you could say backfired on the part of um, uh, Thomas Tuchel and uh, Kepariza Balaga to hand Liverpool what could be the first of four trophies uh, this season. It's a bit far-fetched at the moment. Uh, they are still in the uh, FA Cup. Uh, they've now won the EFL Cup and they, are also, they also have one leg into the quarterfinals of um, the UEFA Champions League. This is after they recorded a 2-0 victory earlier this month, um, a 2-0 victory over Inter Milan. And uh, as well, are also still in the running for the Premier League title. They are currently six points behind Manchester City. Uh, but yesterday, they won the first of the four trophies in which they are still in contention. That is the EFL Cup, uh, the first EFL Cup title that uh, they are winning under their, their manager. That is um, Jurgen Klopp. He lost the 2016 final a few months after he'd been appointed as the Liverpool coach. Lost the 2016 final also on penalties to Manchester City. And since then, he'd not won a uh, domestic cup title. This is his first EFL Cup title in charge of Liverpool. They've obviously already won the Champions League and the Premier League under his reign. But away from uh, the EFL Cup um, uh, into some Premier League news, uh, West Ham recorded a 1 0 victory over uh, Wolverhampton Wanderers in the lone Premier League game played yesterday with uh, Thomas Suchek, uh, the, the Czech Republic international, scoring the game's only goal after picking a pass from Mikhail Antonio. The result means that uh, West Ham move up to fifth on the table, above Arsenal on goal difference, and two points behind Manchester United, who are fourth after United played out a goalless draw. Uh, that was um, over the weekend against Watford. But consecutive draws had seen David Moyes say that is West Ham um, uh, well, lose ground in the battle for the top four uh, slot. 
uh, with uh, Tottenham Hotspurs, Arsenal, Manchester United, and as well as Wolves, all still in contention for that fourth and uh, chi final Champions League spot uh, that is in England. Elsewhere, uh, keeping it international, <coughs> Barcelona maintained their pursuit of uh, Champions League football next season with uh, a 4-0 thrashing over Athletic Bilbao yesterday. Um, and, and the former Arsenal striker, that is uh, Pierre-Emerick Kobemiang, scoring for the third successive game. There was also a goal uh, for the out of favor um, Osman Musa Dembele, as well as um, another strike uh, later in the game. But Barcelona running out for new victors over Athletic Bilbao. Real Sociedad also defeated Osasuna by a goal to nil, while the Sevilla derby ending in a 2 1 draw, a 2 1 win uh, for Real Betis. This was a clash between the, third, the second and third place teams, and uh, Sevilla now increasing the gap between them and uh, Real Betis, their rivals, uh, to eight points but they still trail Real Madrid, the leaders who are also victorious over the weekend. Lots of sporting action, but I'll return later in the day uh, to dissect all the action that happened throughout the weekend, as well as look ahead to what should be another exciting week in the world of sport, but that's pretty much the sport for this hour. I'll be standing as usual as never. This is a point. Thank you so much for coming through and acquainting us with the latest. Thank you, Ramil. And indeed, you're still watching Morning at NTV. Away from this sports update, we'd also like to acquaint you with the latest happening here locally within our jurisdiction of Uganda. Bishop Sylvester Chisitu took office of the shepherd of the newly formed Diocese of Ginger, an Eastern Uganda of the Orthodox Church. In turn, the Vice President, that is Major Jessica Alupo, who was the chief guest as, as the bishop was enthroned, implored the new prelate to strive for equity in the region as it comprises of different tribes. Let's take you there for more. Orthodox Christians in Jinja have welcomed the consecration of Bishop Sylvester Chisitu, who today took over the newly formed Diocese of Jinja and Eastern Uganda at the Holy Resurrection Cathedral in Jinja City. The ceremonies were presided over by newly installed Metropolitan of Ugandan Orthodox Church, Hieronymus Musei. It was also his first time as Metropolitan in his home region, and Busoga Kingdom was represented by their Premier Dr. Joseph Muvawala and various Kingdom officials. Archbishop Hieronymus Musei urged the new bishop to strive for unity and fight poverty in the region through his teachings. We have the mission to spread the Sodoxia in Uganda and in the process to transform the peoples of Uganda. In the mind of the Holy Spirit that elected you, your grace, you are supposed to use Jinja as a best Following the proceedings, Vice President Jessica Alupo, who was the chief guest, highlighted the tribal differences in eastern Uganda and called on the new bishop to be a source of unity. And the tribes are always requesting that she reach all of them, they compete for my nation. Then we have to in his inaugural speech, the new bishop called for support from different stakeholders to fulfill his responsibilities. He also prayed for the Ukrainian nationals who were suffering after the Russian invasion. Brethren, as I am being enthroned today here, my heart cries for the ongoing war between our brothers and sisters. God's people of Ukraine and Russia. As the church, we all lift up our hearts, our hands, and pray that God accept and help them to accept and adopt peaceful dialogue to find solutions for the conflicts between them. To crown the ceremonies, government awarded Bishop Sylvester Chisitu a new Mitsubishi sport car. Well, you're still watching Morning at NTV. We're trying to get through some of the local news stories that broke while you're still in a state of deep slumber.
<clears throat> now, the reopening of the border with Rwanda has opened opportunities for Uganda's grain subsector and exports in general, given the country's position as a major regional supplier. According to analysts, the border point acts as an entry into a wider market space that transcends that is the country of Rwanda. However, the move opens the way for concerns about enhancing post harvest produce. We have more in this report. <laughs> Several weeks after Rwanda lifts restrictions with the travel across its border, business experts are calling on local players to seize the opportunity as this is an entry into the heart of Africa. Not necessarily everything that left Uganda went fully into Rwanda, but some of the traders in Rwanda would get stuff from Uganda and then re-export it to other countries like Burundi, Tanzania, and the, the DRC, which are immediate neighbors. Three years ago, Uganda's annual exports to Rwanda stood at over $200 million, and a significant portion of these exports were food items such as grain. However, most of this went unprocessed and was of low quality. So as Uganda looks to grab this market, government agencies are now calling for the prioritization of quality, especially for grains, to help the country optimize returns from its exports. From this, we shall have our collection centers where we get a sustainable flow of commodities from uh, the farm level through the collection centers and uh, thus to the licensed warehouses that will guarantee uh, good quality products to our destined markets like Rwanda, Burundi, Southern Sudan and uh, the likes of Kenya. The warehouse receipt system allows farmers to deposit their produce in gazetted certified warehouses from where it can be traded after meeting set quality standards. Already, Effort has been invested in getting private warehouse operators to meet both external and internal market quality standards through the system. Right as a point, we have been able to get quality of the maize that goes well into our, our market and we have been able to be appreciated by the World Food Program where is our mini market. The system, according to experts, will be critical in helping the country get well-negotiated grain supply contracts with neighboring countries. We can even start getting formal contracts for those uh, farmers or traders that have been uh, involved in uh, informal trading by securing uh, contracts that can be sustainable and uh, to enable them to uh, supply consistently and uh, sustainably benefit in the... Uh, so as the Katuna border reopens for trade, there is growing interest in how best Uganda can tap into this opportunity this time, focusing on quality as opposed to volumes. Well, <clears throat> that is the latest coming in on the local scene. Before we actually go for a break, let's acquaint you with the latest coming in from Russia. Updates on the Ukraine, in, in, Ukraine invasion within that country. We do know that as of now, it is not a truce being called by Russia, but they are actually grappling with some logistical issues within Ukraine as they try to actually uh, embark on a siege of all the cities within this country. It's not a, a truce at all. It's logistical problem that is according to Germany and also some fuel concerns on the Russian counterparts on their part as they try to make their way into Ukraine. We also do know that out of the 150,000 troops massed on the border with Ukraine, almost one third, that is one out of three of those troops are already into Ukraine. But uh, the other one is still actually on the border waiting for a signal from Russian President Vladimir Putin to actually enter within the city. They were repelled as they tried to take over the second largest city of Ukraine, that is Kharkiv. Yes, that is between Saturday and Sunday night. They were repelled. They also tried to take over Kiev, the capital. Small pockets of uh, Russian invaders actually were able to enter. There were gunfights registered, but they did not take over the capital, Kiev. It's still pretty much under President Vladimir Zelensky, but it says any time from now, if the Western forces do not come together, it could fall at the hands of the Russian invading forces. 4,300 Russians have died, and over 198 civilians and troops within Ukraine have also died. I do have Rashmi Pillai. She is the executive director for the financial sector, depending Uganda. She's going to be talking to us shortly after this break. We'll be right back. You're watching Morning at NTV.
on the next episode is brought to you by Crystal Mineral Water is a sanctuary of refreshment. On the next episode. Oh, God. I can't believe this. This is what I call being in the wrong place at the wrong time. This is just my bad luck. It seems the bump wasn't so serious. Rodrigo's in there with her. And where are they? Here at my grandfather's office. He... Come on in, please. No, no, you go. I'll wait right here. What is Rodrigo doing at that college that's so important, huh? Well, if he's a teacher, I guess he has to teach a class, right? Look, I don't like your attitude, Santiago. I know you're never going to tell me, but you know what? I don't care, because I'm going to find out myself. <sighs> Crystal Mineral Water is a sanctuary of refreshment. The quality of its crystal bottle is stringently verified. Start the year off with my Airtel 4G smartphone! You get to enjoy free 1 GB data valid for a month and 100% bonus data every month for 3 months! only 250,000 Uganda shillings. This includes free data spread over three months worth 86,500 Uganda shillings, making the effective price of the 4G phone 163,500 Uganda shillings only. Airtel, the smartphone network. Watching Morning at NTV. Are you a parent that wants to keep your children educatively engaged? Let's play and learn. Hear the aeroplane. Mm. It's time for learning. It's fun. Wheels on the bus go round and round, round and round. With innovative and interesting lessons. One and zero. Have the kids aged three to six watch Learning is Fun every Saturday and Sunday, 8 a.m. on NTV. On the next episode is brought to you by Crystal Mineral Water is a sanctuary of refreshment. On the next episode. Oh, God. I can't believe this. This is what I call being in the wrong place at the wrong time. This is just my bad luck. It seems the bump wasn't so serious. Rodrigo's in there with her. And where are they? Here at my grandfather's office. Come he... on in, please. No, no, you go. I'll wait right here. What is Rodrigo doing at that college that's so important, huh? Well, if he's a teacher, I guess he has to teach a class, right? Look, I don't like your attitude, Santiago. I know you're never going to tell me, but you know what? I don't care, because I'm going to find out myself. Crystal Mineral Water is a sanctuary of refreshment. The quality of its crystal bottle is stringently verified.
Yes, a very good morning once again, and thank you for joining us right here on Morning at NTV. I'm Romeo Busiku. And of course, this is the number one platform that is joined towards acquainting you with that information that you need to conquer your day, conquer your week vis-a-vis, -vis, conquer your careers. There is no truce at the moment within Ukraine, only a ground-halted offensive. I'll be giving you those details later on, but on the line, I do have Stephen Mbide joining us right now for one update as far as traffic is concerned. A very good morning, Stephen Mbide. Where are you, my brother? Uh, Romeo was sick when you talk about traffic updates. We know that so many people, at least uh, going by the statistics from police, uh, 12 people die per day, and that's why there is a good cause, a good cause that is called Joe Walker. That's why we're here at uh, the headquarters of Monitor Publications Limited, and we're here in Namuongo just to see the flag of, of uh, a journey that's going to be taking. 320 kilometers from Kampala to Wishenya, and this is why uh, Joseph Bayanga here is leading this big team. There are many others see others are still waiting outside, and others are still on the way just to say that yes, we need to pay attention uh, to the issues that are on the road. If you're a pedestrian, if you're a driver, if you're just someone there on the road, just need to know that issues of road safety are key to everyone, and that is why we have these powerful people. I can see the much at Hope here, uh, Ethan Mussolini. Uh, people from Tugende, uh, there is the mother for Je of Be Joseph Bayanga. Be Joseph Bayanga is here, and together we... Uh, uh, are you guys ready? Are you ready? Yeah, we are All right. ready. I can even see the uh, Kampala Metropolitan Police Traffic Commander, uh, Fandi Rogers in Seriko, is also ready uh, for the walk. And of course, uh, many, many people here, uh, the MD of Monitor Publication is also here. But uh, let me first of all un understand, are you ready for the walk? Uh, to the gate, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's the farthest he can go here. Uh, but let me first of all hand over to the man who is driving this cause, uh, just Bayanga. But before that, let me uh, introduce Ben Mwine here. He's the one who is making sure that everyone on the, walk, on the road is safe uh, together with the police. Who works in a court? Uh, yeah, so you see, I have to make sure people are walking, but I'm, I'm not alone. This is being done by people like Salah Warakira. She's been amazing. We've got a young man called Segi who has just blown us away this entire week. Mm -hmm. Our good friend, Simon Kahiru, who you know very well, has been our chair. He's out of the country because he is studying a new job, so we're just filling in for him. Uh, but uh, we are not the stars of the show. The star of the show is Joe and his mom. So mm -hmm. This is about Joe and him alone. We know he's insane. We know he's absolutely you know, crazy. I, I, I disagree with you. It's not about Joe. It's about everyone because many of them have lost people, uh, everyone is maybe the victim of road carnage. Yeah. And this is why it's not... I, is, it a, is it about Joseph Bayanga? It's about you and me going back home safe. <laughs> All right, take it from there uh, <laughs> as we uh, head, head on the way. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank you, each one of you who has come and joined us, either joined us physically as we foot off or is joining us virtually. And wherever you are, you can join this walk. We are doing 320 kilometers to Bushenyi. Every day you can purpose to do 35 kilometers or 30 and you just share on the hashtag Joe Walker or stay in your lane. And let's raise awareness about road safety. 10 people who have woken up like you and me today, they may not be able to go back home because of careless driving, reckless driving. Careless driving and reckless driving, 71% of causes of the accident. Come on, we can do better you and me behind the wheel. The power is in your hands. So join us, let's walk, let's raise awareness. We all need to get to our destination safely and go back home safe. And may God bless you. All right, as uh, we get to Afan Rogers in Sirico, the man who is in charge of making sure that everyone is safe on the road, at least in metro metropolitan Kampala, but of, of, of course across the country. Uh, you as the police, everyone points at you whenever there is an accident, uh, but for this cause, why police is on, on, call, on, on, on board? Of course, um, in partnership with Joe Walker, we are just so happy about this program because it is promoting road safety. As you know, we lose so many people in Uganda, around 3,800 a year, which is such a big number. But if we get partnerships with such a kind of Joe Walker, then we are good to go. And I'm calling for others to please emulate Joe Walker so that we promote road safety. I thank you very much, Joe Walker, for this opportunity and for offering me the opportunity to flag you off. So I'm really, really honored about this program. Thank you. Yeah.
Of course, the reason you see why there is uh, these the banners behind me, uh, Coca-Cola, NTV, Nico Foundation, Tugende, is because everyone is concerned, and that's why National Media Group is part of this cause. I also want to understand from the MD himself, uh, the manager of... Uh, publications, maybe if you can allow and come in the middle here. Uh, why is NMG coming on board? Um, morning everyone. Uh, Nation Media is getting involved because obviously this is a concern to us, but Joseph's also an employee. Joseph came to me last year planning this. Uh, the history, I'm sure he'll take you through himself in his podcast, but uh, he wanted to give something back to society but also emulate something in his history of his family. So Road safety is a concern to us. We, we're on the roads all the time. We run a courier company. Uh, our, our readers and our viewers and our listeners are all part of this community. And as a whole, road safety is, is, a, is, a, is a key development for our country. It really is. It's something that we need to be aware of, not just when we're on the road, when we're walking on the road, when we're driving on the road, when we're on a border border at any particular time. Our awareness and how we behave on the road determines our attitude towards road safety. So it's an attitude change. I drove to work this morning, I had people overtaking me on this side, on that side, and uh, yeah, it was just, I, I've been on leave for three weeks and, uh, and I'm thinking, madness. <laughs> how can you be in such a rush at six o'clock in the morning? Because I was trying to be on time. Uh, so we need to be aware, we need to be considerate, uh, rather arrive, rather drive slowly and arrive safely than rush and not get there at all. Yep. That is the key issue. And it's an attitude. It's, 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 it's not a war on our roads. We're, we're, we should be considerate and we should care for what we're doing. And I'm here to flag Joseph off, and I know I'm going to give you that up, but I'm gonna, don't, I want yeah. to just say, mm. Joseph's not only representing himself and his mom and his family, he represents Uganda. And this is a Uganda thing. It's a patriotic thing. And I have a flag. I want to hand Joseph a flag. Uh, I'm going to make sure. I, I get think that should road. be the last, uh, just right. before that. Uh, to thank you so much, Tony Going Cross. Uh, he's the uh, managing director, uh, Monta Publications, and of course, a uh, nation media group here where we are. Uh, I'll give the last chance to Mami Jedros uh, uh, Baskana. Uh, but first of all, you know, the, he is the spiritual father of Joseph Bayanga there at the uh, Macquarie University Fellowship, Fellowship Christian Center. Uh, Macquarie University Fellowship Christian Center there. Uh, first of all, you've been mentoring Joseph here, and this is part of the fruits he's bearing from you, isn't it? Absolutely. We are so proud of Joseph for this amazing, uh, I, I can call this history in the making here. And I want to appreciate his tenacity in doing this and we are going to support him. I'm going to, as God allows, follow him throughout. And but, but this is a big cause and I would want to call upon all Ugandans to really stay in your lane. You stay in your lane, everybody's going to be safe. So, Joseph, thank you for rallying us into this thing. Thank, thank you, you, Pastor Micah from Makere uh, University Fellowship Church. Uh, Merchant of Hope, uh, um, Ethan Musorin is here. Are you walking up to Vushen? Well, uh, for today, I'll walk the full day, and then I'm planning to join in some of the days because I, uh, my schedule does not allow all the 10 days. Just so you know, I've known Jose since 1994. So we've been best of friends. Uh, we've been each other's best man, so I'm here to rally him on. But like uh, he said, like the MD said, this is a cause for the whole nation. So we pray for safety, and let's all join. the. Jo it's not a Joe Walker campaign. It's, all, it's actually a national campaign. Let's be safe. Which tips are you giving him? Well, he's uh, to stay mentally strong and spiritually strong, but he's been preparing for months, so I know he's super ready. And once he, Jose commits to something, I know he always follows through. I know he'll make it, and of course, with our prayers and mental, emotional support and spiritual support, I know he'll definitely make it. That's why he's called the Merchant of Hope. And finally, uh, Tugende is part of this group. Uh, here is uh, Sarah. Uh, Sarah is not part of Tugende, but uh, she is a sister for sister to Joseph Bayanga, if you didn't know, uh, <laughs> Sarah here. And of course, we've been watching her on morning at NTV many times. But uh, finally, one word from uh, Charles Mwangushi Ampaji, who's here not as a journalist, but he is here as the corporate affairs director of Tugende. Uh, thank you, uh, Steve. And uh, we're very proud. We can't be more proud of Joseph and what he's doing. His two campaigns now. At Tugende, we're big in uh, mobility. We finance mobility. So road safety is critical for us. And like you said, road safety is not for just one individual. It's for all of us. One critical thing is that 10 people or a dozen people 
who woke up this morning are trying to get to work, do something for their family, may not be able to go back home safe, uh, alive. Many, many more others will go back injured and because of how we behave on our roads. Right. So a road safety campaign like he's running is critical for everyone and we can be more proud of him. Thank you so much to Gende. There is Nicole Foundation, but uh, before that, let me speak to Mama. Uh, because she is, uh, we have Joseph here and who is leading the cause uh, for road safety, the Joe Walker. Mama, uh, <laughs> <coughs> I, Ndiyaha kutambara kwa Josephu. Josephu ugu no mwana wanje nizara diya kana kamzaro kwa akasha tunju. Orkumi ugu enda shanju na mshanju. Kani nye sugecha kwa ya yeze kukora na chukoro muizi na diya yesu. Kana hati ndiyo ni mshavara ni mahu na za kuhende la orijendo gwe akeje bushenyi. Kani vito bushenyi tumtejerize kumwachi ilano kwa chiri mwa waka mpara mwena ntubeta omuka bushenyi. You are welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, may I have request uh, Tony Greencross, the managing director, uh, National Media Group, to come with Nicole here, uh, Joseph Beyanga. Uh, please come in the middle here. Uh, Joseph, uh, you represent the country. Mm -hmm. And for ev everyone who is here, who is part of the flag of, uh, may you come closer so that we can uh, give them the morale as yeah. we set off. Uh, this side, I request you to face this side. I request you to face this side. Mm. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, here we are at the flag off, and I will hand over uh, the microphone to Tony Green Cross to oh, yeah. see uh, the flag off. All right, Joseph, remember you represent the country. Good luck. Drink lots of water. Watch the road. Be careful. And uh, to everyone out there who happens to see Joseph on the road, wish him well and drive carefully around them, especially. <laughs> all right. We wish you all the best. Joseph, good luck. Thank you so thank you so so much Nicole Foundation Tugende, Nicole Foundation N NTV, Spark TV, KFM, Dembe FM, uh, Day Monitor, Saturday Monitor and all the brands of Monitor Publications, Coca-Cola and everyone who is part of this cause. This is our cause. This is what we should take uh, from me and from them that this is not about Joe Walker, just Bayanga, but it's all about you and me, everyone who is watching, everyone who uses the Lord. And I know you to use the road. Let's be safe on the road. Now, let's head to Bushenyi. Yeah! Very energetic, and I love that so much. Many thanks to the whole NMG team that braced the launch of that event all the way from Namwongo into Bushenyi. The pedestrian walk to highlight the road fatality that has claimed so many of our citizens all over the world. 2021 alone, 1.1 million people died on the road, including pedestrians. This year alone, since January of 2022, over 215,000 people have suffered died as a result of these road carnage accidents in that regard. So please exercise caution as you drive on the road and also as a pedestrian. You need to be looking left, right, and also right again as you actually cross that road so that you do not get knocked down in a jiffy in that regard. All right, <clears throat> we have the ED of uh, uh, financial sector deepening Uganda. That is Rashmi Pillai, he joins me right now to talk about uh, the plight of the SMEs, the small medium enterprises in that regard and how recovery funds are helping them alleviate the situations they find themselves knee deep in Maya. A very good morning, Rashmi Pillai. Romeo and good morning to your viewers. Uh, Rashmi Pillai, I advocated this show almost a month ago, but before I left, yes, their economy had been largely resuscitated. Uh, schools were reopened, the economy was reopened, but then only the bus had been stopped from reopening uh, two weeks after the students had gone back to school. Now, I would like you to paint for me a picture of how the SMEs are recuperating as a result of the full reopening of our economy since January of 2022. How are they faring? Thank you, Romeo, for the question. So if, um, so the question is, if I understood you correctly, is to paint you a picture after the economic opening and uh, how MSMEs are performing at the mm -hmm. moment. 
Um, so I would say that there is, as the monetary policy of the central bank has stated, there is certainly progress, there is hope, and MSMEs are seeing an increase in demand, an increase in consumption. But there is still a long way to go. A two years of limited operational environment for MSMEs has had quite a devastating effect on their take-home incomes. Our own research has shown that the medium monthly household before the lockdown in 2019 towards the end was 900,000 for an average uh, household that was, you know, the main source of income was either a micro or a small business. And it dropped by 50% by the end of 2021. So that that is going to take some time in terms of recovery. And we are glad to support the government of Uganda's efforts by complementing our own fund, which is 70 billion shillings for micro and small enterprises along with the Mastercard Foundation. Rashmi Pillai, what are some of the other, you know, grievances affecting the MSMEs as we speak right now? So the other drivers that are affecting mm. MSMEs, one of the biggest is the drop in aggregate demand. There isn't enough. So people have been, you know, during the past two years, there were layoffs, people's take-home income decreased. Therefore, the kind of uh, buying patterns or consumption patterns have dropped, and therefore sales revenues have dropped, and take-home income of businesses has gone down. Second is supply chain-related issues. There's a big issue around inventory, how goods are coming in and out because of backlog due to COVID shutdown and multiple worldwide supply chains. That has also created the cost of doing business has gone high. Thirdly, because transportation was also um, uh, under a lockdown, that also created gaps, in, uh, and now transportation providers are also, along with supply chain, trying to increase the cost of transports of goods and services. All of this adds to the cost of doing business. All of this has an impact on the profitability of businesses. We would like to also know, Rashmi Pillai, what is the MSME Recovery Fund, the micro, small and medium-sized enterprise recovery fund, and uh, what kind of help have these people received during the, uh, the last couple of months as far as recovery funds are concerned? Sure. Uh, just to clarify, uh, the fund that FSD Uganda has established with the support of the MasterCard Foundation's Young Africa Works program is a 70 billion shilling fund. We just recently launched it. The target audience is only micro and small businesses. We are not trying to uh, duplicate what the government of Uganda is already doing with their small business recovery fund. So their fund targets typically slightly more mature, slightly uh, bigger ticket sizes of loans, whereas the businesses that we are targeting need loans as low as 100,000 shillings to a maximum of 10 million shillings. So these are really small enterprises. And the way they can access these extremely subsidized loans is through microfinance institutions. So we are working with deposit-taking microfinance institutions or non-deposit-taking microfinance institutions and SACOs. Of course, when it comes to accessing finances, they've been grappling with so, so many issues, like the criteria to be followed uh, for one to access this money. What is being done to alleviate such challenges? That's that's a great question. So we are working. That's particular. Actually, that's one of the reasons that we are working with microfinance institutions. Mm. So microfinance institutions, SACO. So let's take SACO. SACOs are membership-driven organizations. So they they either are driven by the economic. They are formed by the economic activity, whether that's agriculture or agro processing. So they know they are members, and they they will be able to disburse loans because it's a membership-driven organization. They don't require you to be formally. They already know what business you're in. Then you let's take non-deposit taking microfinance institutions. They're in the business of lending to small businesses and micro businesses for a long time. They know how to act. Uh, they know what other kinds of mitigation mechanisms they can have in place in order to make sure that businesses return the capital that has been extended to them. For example, some the way microfinance works is that typically they ask for a cash collateral, like you put a small deposit down and you get the total extent of the loan that you need. So it's not necessarily a hard collateral or a formal uh, sort of, you know, license registration that's always required. And Rajmi Pillai, we've seen several funds, yes, being uh, recovery funds being initiated in the last two years. Um, what makes the MSE recovery funds so different? Yeah, again, another great question, Romeo. So for us, what we realized is 
based on FSD Uganda is an evidence-based organization. We work with the central bank, the Ministry of Finance to produce data that is meaningful and then create initiatives that can, you know, that's based on information that we have gathered from the market. So what we realized is that a lot of the funds that are being established will and should, rightfully so, will go to a lot of the medium-sized or maybe even some of the larger small businesses. But we, our data has showed that there's about a 1.8 million um, owner, operator, one person or two people enterprises that will not recover until 2023 or after if there's not something specific done for them. And our uh, me, uh, you know, micro and small enterprise fund, the way it has been designed is for these extremely small businesses. It is for these, it is for, to ensure that 50,000 micro and small enterprise MSMEs at the end of the five-year facility will be able to recover. It is to ensure that 100,000 jobs that are at risk will recover and will add 150,000 new jobs to wages or salaries. So our focus is very specific. When this economy was reopened in January, we had anticipated that mainly most of the businesses within this country would come back and start operating. But uh, that is largely not what we've seen on the ground. Many of the businesses have not opened up for operations. What are some of the factors behind that and what are you doing to alleviate those challenges? Uh, so I think that it is going to take time. Um, it is well understood that once the economy was opened in January, we're, we're just in the third month, like going to be in the third month of the year. It is going to take time because the devastating effects of two years of not having enough cash flows, not having enough revenues and being struggling with supply chain, cost of businesses going high, it is going to take a long time to recover. Many businesses that took loans before or after during COVID will have to restructure and are already restructuring their loans. After after that, there needs to be an increase in consumer demand. We have also seen that some of the businesses shut down and are now starting new businesses. They have pivoted because the capital isn't enough revenue that is coming in. It will take that recovery journey and that trajectory is going to take time. Uh, that being said, I do think we are on the right path. The government's efforts, as well as the efforts of the private sector, are going to stimulate the economy. Um, I do think, however, coupled with that, there needs to be more directed effort uh, in terms of helping businesses, uh, financial literacy, helping them with understanding how to run their businesses better. So partnerships with organizations that can help entrepreneurs or small business owners recover sooner. And that can be done even by financial institutions that are extending loans to them. They can also help them manage their businesses better, will add significantly in their recovery. Besides the issue of finances, we also do know that many of these businesses did not have the skill mindset to actually um, operate their businesses in that regard, meaning they did not have the skills, but they did have the finances. When the economy did reopen, many of whom could not actually come back into the fold because of the same. Others could have access to credit, but not access to the skills that they need to actually ensure that their businesses are a success. As financial sector, depending Uganda, are you also actually ensuring that you traverse this fear, acquainting them with the skills and the knowledge that they need besides just injecting cash into their projects? Rashmi. Great. Um, and that's a very important question, Romeo. So uh, financial sector deepening Uganda's mandate is on greater access to finance, whether that's payment, savings, credit, insurance, or long-term pensions for the most marginalized and vulnerable in the community. Are skill building important? Absolutely. It needs to be coupled with access to finance. Finance in of itself is not a solution to uh, helping businesses or even people get out of poverty. Um, but is that our mandate? I would say not exactly. We typically do that by partnering with other organizations in the country that have the competencies and come with experience of skill building. And so we do that through partnerships because our expertise and area is on finance. So yes, absolutely necessary and we will do it through partnerships. Uh, let's talk about paying back Rashmi Pillai because you are targeting a big number of projects or so businesses. 50,000 people or businesses are being targeted by your venture. Um, plans to pay back. Break them down for us. Sorry, Romy, you'll have to repeat that question. I'm not sure I got you. The number of projected businesses are 50,000 that you're going to be helping with this money. The 70 billion you're going to shillings. Are there any plans to pay back? Rashmi. 
sorry. So yes, I did get the question on 50,000 businesses being our target, but I'm uh, I'm not able to get the later part of the question. Maybe it's technology. Sorry, Romeo. Uh, Rashmi Pillai, you are targeting 50,000 businesses with this project. Those are the uh -huh. beneficiaries. Are there any plans to pay back? What are the steps to be followed? Oh, so, uh, so the question is, how are they expected to pay back, right? So the way the fund is structured is that we will give loans to microfinance institutions mm. and to deposits. So we are giving it to participating financial institutions. And these financial institutions, and we are choosing financial institutions that have experience working with micro and small enterprises. So that's actually a big selection criteria. And they will then on lend it to the business businesses that they work with because they're in the business of giving money out. So we're working through them. And the risk of returning the entire capital back to the fund is on the financial institution. And we're giving the money at very subsidized rates to these financial institutions to actively nudge them to lower interest rates to help these businesses get cheaper access to capital, therefore being helping them pay back. We have SMEs that are adamant to get back into the fold simply because they are not sure the economy might largely still remain open. Many people think, well, I might come out two weeks later and the government says there's another lockdown. What kind of advice do you have to such skeptical business people? Uh, to be frank, Romeo, I doubt if we'd survive another lockdown. It is going to be very devastating for this okay. economy if we go into another lockdown. And that's the truth of the matter. I do think that companies that were able to be agile and were able to adopt um, digital means of reaching their customers, so you need the ability to reach your customers, so you should, uh, they should be able to buy products and goods online. Then you need to be integrated to payment services like mobile money, banks, et cetera, so your customers can pay for you and then be able to deliver that goods. So that entire operating model needs to be figured out by businesses. Some of them have been able to, a lot of them still struggled, especially if they're informal businesses. And what happened during the pandemic is flat a lot of the thin these small businesses, micro businesses on their platforms because they realized that that was a real need. We will see more of that happening. That clearly has been a big economic shift in multiple countries, including Uganda, and that is only going to grow. Um, but that, again, will take time. So if we go into another lockdown, um, it is going to take a lot more to help these businesses recover. Rashmi Pillai, in the wake of the continued raging COVID-19 pandemic, you also do have wars skyrocketing on various peninsulas or within the world. You understand what I'm saying? Ukraine, Russia, you do have governments within Africa that are seeing mutinies and so forth. Political climate is actually increasingly becoming so hot within various jurisdictions uh, coupled with COVID-19. As a business person, what, would I, what should I have in mind as I am back on resuscitating my business operations during this COVID-19 pandemic moving forward? Forward. What should I have in my mind, at the back of my mind? Rashmi. Great. Um, so, Romeo, I think you, you've, and NTV has already covered this. So the crisis is going to, you know, we should be very cognizant of the cost of fuel prices. And we, we are seeing that happening world over because there are multiple reasons it's um, uh, for that. But the crisis, the Ukraine crisis is going to, that is something you should be careful about. And when fuel prices increases, it then just increases the cost of transportation, of goods, supply. That has a direct impact on the cost of operations and the cost of doing business in any country so then that has a direct impact on the profitability of enterprises and that needs so that means enterprises need to be very careful of how they are managing their expenditures their outflows and their cash flow management so and they're all how they're also negotiating with their suppliers um, and customers so if i were in a business those are factors i would keep in mind Pillai, are you afraid that moving forward we could be seeing the dissolution of SMEs within this country? They make up 90% of the labor force within this country, but with the meager funding that we are seeing coming in from the government, stimulus packages um, dwindling as they are from the government to the SMEs, are you afraid that moving forward we might see the decimation, the end of the private sector, the SMEs as they are, if we do not inject more money, if COVID-19 persists, if the political climate continues to heat up, are you worried that all these events coupled together might kill the SMEs? Uh, 
So, Romeo, just to clarify the question, was the question that is there a real threat to the uh, uh, to SMEs actually dying out, which employ the largest number of people? Is, in, is that the question? Indeed, Rashmi, in the wake of COVID-19, in the wake of mega funding and recovery funds from the government and so forth, what do you make of that? Climate change. Mm. So, um, first and foremost, what the Uganda Bureau of Statistics uh, panel surveys have shown is there has been a significant increase in poverty in the past two years, in the past couple of years, actually. And that has a big impact on financial inclusion. If people don't have money in their pockets, they're not going to save. It's very hard for them to access credit. And that does mean that that will then result in greater and greater unemployment. And if you're more unemployed, you don't have enough money for even education. So that has a generational impact. So if there we if, therefore it is very important that these stimulus packages, whether that's, uh, and I shouldn't probably, it's not just stimulus, actually these funds, the Small Business Recovery Fund, the Parish Development Model that the government of Uganda has launched, and our own fund, and our own fund, like the private sector initiatives like ours, target the right enterprises. So targeting is actually a very big issue and it's not an easy challenge. So we will be working collectively with the government and other private sector actors to make sure we are targeting the right businesses, we're helping and giving them the support that they need. Um, but it, the truth of the matter, is there will be some businesses that will die and they will resuscitate. What needs to then happen is that when they come back with different ideas, when they come back with new ways of doing business, are there support mechanisms for them? Are there skill building opportunities for them? And that's where uh, support from the entire private sector and development community comes together. Bilal, you did mention the Paris development model, the 490 billion shilling PDM. Do you think it is the magic bullet that we need to actually arrest this situation as far as the SMEs are concerned? At the parish level, you talked about targeting the vulnerable people at the grassroots. Do you think the PDM is the magic bullet that will go a long way in alleviating the challenges of the SME, 75% of whom are in agriculture? Absolutely. I do think the parish development model was really well thought through, well designed. And it is, you know, year on year, the way the government is looking at it, it is looking at increased uh, Can continue, so Rashmi. <coughs> she is the ED of... Uh... Fundamental... Hi. <coughs> Hello. Yes, we can still hear you, Rashmi Pillai. Continue. Okay. And the two big pillars of the PDM, one is our education and the second is financial inclusion, which as if I have to quote the PSSD, are opportunity equalizers. They are meaning that that if you have the opportunity, irrespective of which background you come from, rich or poor, if you have the right and proper education and access to financial services and access to finance, you will have an opportunity pathway to better your, um, better your life, better your livelihood, and go up the economic ladder. So, th so the parish development model is built on those two pillars. There are more pillars. But, so I do think that the way it has been designed will have a long way, will go a long way in, in helping the recovery of MSMEs and help Uganda achieve its national development goals. Of course, Rajmi Pillai, let's talk about the help that has come in from the government. We in the financial year 2020, 2021, some 555 billion Uganda shillings was operationalized in UDP for the SMEs. Now, 2021-2022, we did see some 53 billion Uganda shillings being accorded to the SMEs. Are you satisfied with the financial help that has come in from the central government? Rajmi? One more needs to be done. Sorry, Rom. <clears throat> Uh, sorry, Romeo, I'm not sure I was able to... Uh, apologies, technology issues. Indeed. I'm not sure I was able to hear Rush the question. Me. Is the question on... UDB? Yes, Rashmi Pillai, in the financial year 2020 2021, 555 billion was put into UDB for the SMEs. 2021 2022, 53 billion was put into UDB for the SMEs. Do you think that help actually went a long way in helping them alleviate their challenges? And what more should be done if it was little? Great. Uh, thank you, Romeo, for that question. Yes, absolutely. UDB has been taking, uh, you know, has has been at the forefront in supporting medium-sized businesses. Uh, so the UDB, I would say, is uh, targeting more mature businesses rather than uh, micro and small businesses. That is not necessarily the mandate of UDB. And medium-sized businesses employ a lot of individuals. So it's very clear where their target audience is, why that is the target audience, and how they are looking at employment multiplier sectors like 
like agriculture, manufacturing, they employ the largest number of uh, people. And therefore, the focus of UDB is definitely on employment sectors that have the largest multipliers, um, thereby increasing economic transformation of the country. I do think UDB should, in terms of what they could do next, I think they are very focused on the sectors that they are moving forward, which is great. They may also probably want to investigate models of how they can work through other intermediaries to channel their funds to smaller businesses as well. So that's one model I'm sure that they are investigating on how to channel their funds to smaller businesses or through SACOs and other cooperatives that could use concessionary capital from UDP. Tell Rajmi Pillai, the money in UDB has not helped the SMEs because it was not going to the small businesses, but rather medium and big businesses in a nutshell. <coughs> That's what you mean? Yeah. Rush yeah, they're going, uh, mm. yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, they are. That's the target. That's the target for UDB, and and, and rightfully so because they're looking at more uh, companies that generate employment, uh, companies in sectors that are responsible for economic transformation within the national development plans. They are now actively thinking about. Uh, small businesses, micro businesses, what is a good model for them to actually support these businesses? But traditionally, their focus has been medium businesses, yes. During the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw dwindling donor funds streaming into our economy as Uganda. We would like to, you know, paint a picture for us of how that dwindling um, money actually affected the SMEs within our country. They cut shortages from the donors. Sure. So I would I would actually be remiss if I did not say talk about it in terms of gender. So in terms of uh, SMEs and their dwindling uh, expenditures, what we have seen is incomes for small businesses and micro businesses dropped by 50 percent. If they were a male driven business, it dropped by 50 percent. But if it was a female driven business, it dropped by 67 percent. Most women had to also do their dual responsibility during COVID of child care, home care, while also supporting a very flagging, struggling business with an, a shutdown or with limited transportation, curfews, etc. So these businesses will need specific support. And that's why when it comes to our micro, small and enterprise, we that 40% of the focus should be on women-led or women-operated businesses. And, and that's one of our uh, key focus areas. The other area that had, the other demographic that was really badly hit is young people. Young people running their businesses. Already, you're, you know, it's an early stage business. If you're a young person, you have challenges around access to finance. And then you suddenly have shutdowns and lockdowns. You don't, and you're struggling with all of that because you don't have enough savings, buffers, or even social capital to help help um, restart your business. So that's another demographic that our fund will focus on and has a big target to focus on. So that is Rashmi Pillai, the ED of a financial sector deepening Uganda. Now from the investigations you've been mounting and from your perspective as financial sector deepening Uganda, what could be done to alleviate most of the challenges we've highlighted during the last 20 to 30 minutes or so, so that the SMEs can actually thrive within this country? Rashmi Pillai, recommendations. Great. So in conclusion, Romeo, I think uh, A, very targeted access to finance for different uh, segments, so micro, small, and medium businesses will go a long way. Second, restructuring some of the existing loans, so uh, especially you know of companies that are reasonably doing well and we know are on the path to recovery. And number three, partnering with capacity building organizations and skill building organizations, particularly for micro and small businesses. Um, and uh, lastly, making it easy for them for all types of businesses to access these various funds that have been set up by the government and private sector will go a long way in their recovery. That is Rashmi Pillai. Thank you so much for having made the time to speak to us right here on Morning at 10 TV. Thank, Thank you. you so Thank you, Romeo. Thank you. Indeed. She is the executive director for financial sector deepening Uganda. Still in the uh, sphere of business, we also do know that the Russian rubble has actually tumbled over 30 percent as a result of their invasion within Ukraine. That is the latest information coming in right here on Morning at NTV. And that is largely hinged on the sanctions that have befallen the Russian territory as a result of the Ukrainian invasion that has also seen 4,300 of the Russian troops killed since that is 
February 24th of last week. We also do know that 198 people have died within Ukraine, three of whom were civilians. President Zolod Vladimir Zelensky is telling us that the Russians are not actually leaving any stone unturned. They're bombing kindergartens, they're bombing residential buildings, they're bombing anything that is in sight and anything that is moving in that regard. But what we do know from the international, international scene is that Russia um, is not actually going to be let, you know, uh, is, is not going to be allowed to actually orchestrate all these heinous uh, orchestrations on the whole global stage. France is sending help, Germany is sending help, Denmark is sending help, Sweden is sending help. We also do know that the United Kingdom is also going to be sending help. NATO is reading their, you know, rapid response team to actually enter Ukraine and alleviate the situation. For now, there is no truce, but rather a ground invasion that is halted at the hands of the Russians over ideological issues like fuel. We'll be right back. You're watching Morning at NTV. Start the year off with my Airtel 4G smartphone. You get to enjoy free 1 GB data valid for a month and 100% bonus data every month for three months at only 250,000 Uganda shillings. This includes free data spread over three months worth 86,500 Uganda shillings, making the effective price of the 4G phone 163,500 Uganda shillings only. Airtel, the smartphone network. Are you a parent that wants to keep your children educatively engaged? Let's play and learn. Hear the aeroplane. Mm. It's time for learning is fun. Wheels on the bus go round and round, round and round. With innovative and interesting lessons. It's one and zero have the kids aged three to six watch learning is fun every saturday and sunday 8 a.m on ntv there's a new look to beauty elegance freedom style now available in the new look of the radiant hair relaxer with herbal extracts and no base formula designed to make your hair look straight and elegant as you look beautiful and in control. Available in all stores, outlets, and saloons. Radiant. Look good. Feel great. Radiant is a brand of Morbid products. Jessa Full Cream Milk. Same great taste, now in a new pack. Jessa, start your adventure. On the next episode is brought to you by Crystal Mineral Water is a sanctuary of refreshment. On the next episode. Oh, God, I can't believe this. This is what I call being in the wrong place at the wrong time. This is just my bad luck. It seems the bump wasn't so serious. Rodrigo's in there with her. And where are they? Here at my grandfather's office. Come on in, please. No, no, you go. I'll wait right here. What is Rodrigo doing at that college that's so important, huh? Well, if he's a teacher, I guess he has to teach a class, right? Look, I don't like your attitude, Santiago. I know you're never gonna tell me, but you know what? I don't care, because I'm gonna find out myself. Crystal Mineral Water is a sanctuary of refreshment. The quality of its crystal bottle is stringently verified. The Energy Moment is brought to you by the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development in partnership with the GIZ Promotion of Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Program. Save energy by selectively removing some of the lights where lighting levels exceed established standards or where this will not reduce the quality of the light output for its intended purpose. Although energy efficient products have a high initial cost, your electricity bills reduce forever and you recover your investment eventually. The Energy Moment is brought to you by the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development in partnership with the GIZ Promotion of Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Program.
Monitor and KPMG are ready to make your new year more inspiring with the Uganda Top 100 Mid-Sized Companies Dialogue on Thursday, 3rd March 2022 at 2.30 p.m. with the experts, Mr. Charles Ochichi, Executive Director, Enterprise Uganda, Dr. Paul Chalimpa, Deputy Director General UIA, and Mr. Robert Wanok, Head of Personal and Business Banking, DFCU Bank. Tune in live on NTV and get advice on consolidating innovations, achievements and processes achieved post-COVID-19 pandemic. Join the discussion on Facebook and Twitter at Daily Monitor or KPMG East Africa with the hashtag Top 100 SMEs. Sponsored by Uganda Investment Authority and DFCU Bank. Did you know that if a SIM card registered in your name is used to commit a crime, you'll be presumed to be the criminal. The person whose name a SIM card is listed is presumed to be the owner unless reported stolen or lost. Dial star 197 hash and follow the prompts to check SIM cards registered under your NIN. To remove a number wrongfully registered using your NIN, please visit your mobile provider service center. Do not let your NIN be used for crime. Act now. Tofera, this message is powered by the Uganda Communications Commission. One expert, enjoy true feelings, a flood of emotions, a rush of adrenaline, the taste of victory. Are you ready? One Expert operates under Advanced Gaming Limited and is licensed and regulated by the National Lotteries and Gaming Regulatory Board. Betting is addictive and can be psychologically harmful and it is eligible to persons above 25 years of age. Don't fill our moment with Uganda Communications Commission. No telecom provider will ever call you and ask for your personal details like your PIN or password. Never say your PIN, password or OTP. Tom Feder. Tom Feder Moment brought to you by Uganda Communications Commission. You're watching Morning at NTV. A very good morning once again and many thanks for staying with us right here on Morning at NTV. We do have some breaking news for you at Bilal Secondary School, which was gutted by a fire. First forward, let me take you there to my reporter, Steven Imbide, who is already on the side, frantic parents and teachers already moving about within the jurisdiction that you see the premises of the school. Steven Imbide is going to be giving us an update. Emergency response teams are already on the ground. Let's get there to get some kind of audio on what is happening there. Good morning, Steven in Bidder once again, my brother, bring us up to speed with the latest surrounding Bilal Secondary School fire. Yes, uh, Romeo, what's happening here is that it's a sad story. If, uh, in here at uh, Bilal Islamic Secondary School here in Hawaii, it's uh, just uh, next to the traffic lights there, a few uh, parents are just being allowed in after being screened and get to know that, yes, they are the ones to have uh, the victims of this fire. I'm talking about uh, those uh, students of Senior 1 and Senior 2 because their dormitory caught fire last evening. It was around 9 p.m. when the students were in the dormitory we were in the classroom for the night preps and this is a story that I'm getting uh, to the detail here that no student was injured at least by going by the accounts of uh, some of the students and of course these students I'm getting to are the ones who are dumb, uh, the scholars because the, the boarding scholars are not allowed anywhere close to this gate and that's why uh, the police is all mounting here uh, their, their detail here is here just to make sure that no parents uh, who are not having students in senior one or senior two allowed to check on the stu their students. Uh, the police here, you see, is uh, are trying to ascertain the cause of the fire, uh, but many parents are here uh, still denied entry. And you can see the police are trying to the Banaba,
Lal Secondary School, where a fire gutted the jurisdiction in that regard. The premises have lost a lot in uh, millions of money uh, in property that was lost in that fire. Some of the onlookers <clears throat> and the witnesses were actually giving us an account of what actually uh, transpired at that school. It is not the only major school within the country that has been gutted by fire. Good Times Infantry in Entebbe was also gutted by fire and a host of other schools have actually been following the same fate. We are going to get back to Stephen Imbide to get a real, real grasp of what is happening at Bilal Secondary School, but we are still grappling with some technical difficulties in that regard. Why do fires continue to take center stage every time? I remember when schools were being, <clears throat> you know, thought of to be reopened. Many people were telling me, you wait two to three weeks, a month or so into the reopening of our schools, you'll be hearing. So and so uh, has been uh, gutted in the fire in such a school. So they were telling me that such situations were actually uh, anticipated in that regard because majorly some of these schools were never given money to work on most of the wiring, the electrical appliances within the uh, jurisdictions and so forth. So many of those uh, <clears throat> wires could have gone faulty um, as a result of the uh, incapacitation of, of many of these schools to put in place measures to actually ward off such such um, accidents when they take center stage. They did not get money for a full refurbishment of their jurisdictions in that regard. Stephen Imbida is still at Bilal Secondary School that was gutted by a fire that is at around 9.30 in, in, uh, last night. That's what we are getting right here on Morning at NTV. Uh, so we shall get back to Stephen Imbida later on when the situation is rectified but at the moment Seven Mbida is back and we are still at Bilal's Islamic uh, primary school in that regard all right that is uh, of course the Bilal Islamic primary school side and we are still at the section of the secondary school where uh, many of uh, the parents here are still being denied entry into the school because uh, police and the authorities here of uh, the school are trying to establish the actual cause of the fire and the extent uh, to which this fire this inferno uh, left the school Sulaiman Sevana Chitta, Nganyenomu is one of Bilal Islamic School, Wa S1. Nayama Ulire is a Nagafunya Sawa and Gasat Chitundu is a Chiro, Nengamba Nenda Kerao Kusomero, you know, around to Sawano Sakumina Birich Tondo, Zigenda Vich for a non Sanzeva Zadeva Nangeva to Seda, Nava Police Abatono Tono Evali, Neneva to Gano Puyingira, Neva to Gamba Valinda DPC, DPC Watu Se, Kati Vasazeo. Tivagenda kugula geti ngaba to kumi kumi beba yingira to sovolo kubera nga to lava kubaza deba ba kubana ba fe kubanga te wali no mu yala bi kumana we te tumani chiri mundeyo katonda ya singo kumanya esebo bebaza ala rokubanti tuna kufuna mbela yona yokubanti waliwo omwezi yena ya kosedwa nenga bora ba emabega wano beba mu kubazadde naba mu kubayizi abasumira mu somero lino bachagani dwo kubanga abayingira kubanga police egeza ako naba kulembeze abakuri de somero lino okulaba anti dala abayingira bebazadde ate abayingiza ngabo ulide bagambe 10 10 bokaboka ne bafuruma ono bali kubayingiza abalala police with the authorities are still trying to establish the cause and extent of the fire ngenda kuogera ko nabayizi aba somera waneno nenga bo nawo tubakirizidwa kubanga bayingira olwalero kubanga basoma osomera wano esebo alinyagwa zemudiba yafati ye Naye echi tufu chidi inti. Tuwaka kwa inga kubatu ina anwa waganda bafe. Tuwaka inga ina tuwa labe kome tima jitede ede. Ok, wabali nyo. Sebo. Haji sebo wa sote. Mungu sebo wa sote. Namu uli. Namu labi ina chiba kudeko wa neno. Chia kudeo. Chia kudeo. Ok. Mama. Ngo labi ina chia kudeo wa neno. Ndami nyo sebo. Namu uli waka sangu. Mbade, mbade yu wake kangulu mira. Nempulira, nempulira nga waga mbesobo ya bidali. Kwa nse chiri inde. Nesala wo kujia, ndavo mwana. Kuhuo mwana, mbade nzijia mutu wala mudua ilo kumulo ungosa. Na ya ati, ndava, nsanze waneno, ndava, banga mbesome vya hidi kwa kudukira wa mamu nzijia. Kwa 
omwana wo mulwadde omutwala muddwa yo kumulongoosa kino kizibu kya kubiri atenga kye kikule nnyo ogezeza kugwira kona abapulire somero lino bagambe kizibu kyo ina ne kubanga appointment yo ina kufala omwana ngezeza ko bagamba naye bachaganya okugulawo ati simanyi ngenda kola basimanyi nti obo omwana ali stede njala kumulabako naye bisobedde Nzene <laughs> Bana vede tu mani kuku guavu debi buza buza. Wauli diza kupanda chipe bagamba wali munda bichi solo. Munda. Bade sina gena wauli de. Bana wau bagamba abamu teba bade. Baba demu kundi. Baba demu kira sezinga baba soma. Uliwe gua kuati de. Baba demu. These are some of the students and the parents here at the Bilal Islamic uh, Secondary School, uh, of course, next to Bilal Islamic Primary School here in Waise, just a few meters from the traffic lights of Waise. Uh, this school uh, reportedly, uh, the dormitory of senior one and senior two students caught fire around 9 p.m. Uh, when the students were in a lecture uh, for the evening Sunday preps. Uh, but here, uh, police is trying to ascertain the cause and extent of the damage uh, together with the authorities. They are just allowed allowing in a few uh, parents, just a, two, a count of 10, then they get out and then uh, allowing others. This is just because they are trying to control the crowds inside and give space to those who are investigating as well as uh, those who are on the, on, on the work of... Let me speak to one of the authorities of this school is trying to... Uh, who is also uh, the, the mayor of Kawempe Division, uh, Emmanuel Serunyoji Owedembe, is trying to... is inside and trying to speak to... Some can see Mzada atu walo muana we, buli mzada atu walo muana we, okumale na kwe ntono tono, tutuule na sechulite, tulabe nteke kengiri jene jene damu, katena habana bali na okudamu kusoma. Tuwa agadaba leme kutata ganyizuwa mkusoma kwa abwe, na yate uruo kutio kuliwo, eliyaba zate, na habana trauma ilije bafu nye, tuga ambaba dekeka, baveyo, uruvanyuma bajeba some. Tukena kumita sechulite miki, kusawa tano wano, to Salewe Chenko Merede. Nenga police chano nyeleza elabo mulilo guafu dekuchi. Nengo bukule mbeze weka wempe tulumiru wamu nesomero na yate nga tutandiso kwebu zebibu zobinji. Luwacho mulilo guzemu wate nge viyali wo viyandibanga vili nge viyazemu viyali wo kumurundi guli. Mulilo nga guochi kufuno mulilo guamirundi ena mu division yange kati amasomero kati gaga no gali abiri eri awali abana new christ abana bafa atebo tunula wano just chinyana mpindi ekibanda kya eche 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 mbawo kya kutto muliro ate wali mu mu mbakere yo kusatu ate ero muliro gwaji gwaya seo so tutandiso kwebuza chichi meya okutwalira wa mu mwafu na makunyika ku report zo na ku muliro kuzo kubira mu kasera kanu kona tubade tudi abakufuna report era tuzibanja na dalo gwaso ka gwali gwa makere seri tuzibanja ogwe somero lya new christ abana banaba afa tuchaji banja atera na na guno gonda tuchagu banja na ye fenga bukulembeze tugenda kuteka wentegeka twagala aba abazadde na abasomesa ba ba ba, ba, ba kirisiganye na fe ntite wagenda kubera ho somero mu kawempe editor ina security cameras mm. tisoka abazadde basobola kubera abagumu twagenda kuba ho somero lisuza bana nga teriri na uh, installation ya masenyaze tugenda kujidda mbuto buli somero 
buli somero ebisulo ne we basomera amasenyaze ga demo ga keberebwe engineer wa division ateke dwo kugenda okebera buli masanyalazi buli somero the installation ya masanyalazi ye ye kinzi bwa mu mateka ebye bintu ebibiri bwe tubikola tukoze ku security tukoze ne ku installation ya masanyalazi subira tujja kuwa tuina kitu zize cyo meya nzira muko ku biki ebiyite extent ya bidao ya extent ya eyo muliro ah emifali so jaba na jonna aba s1 na aba s2 jiwedeo boxes zabo zona ebintu ebya ebitabo byabo byo nebisinga kubanga mwana bwabage na prep agenda na kitabe echo kyagenda okusomesa apo ebitabo byo na boxes zona ziweddeo ebitanda byo na biweddeo roofs zona za gudem abanda bonno ebintu byo nani bigwao kusinzira ngagwa yingi deko munda mu kisera kigamba ntyo muri gwavu deko no kubafena ku miriryo jo neji bade jizza miroji ya edo ya mirundi ebiri okuokerera oba a uh, okubanga uh, gwazi gwatandikide mu kizimbe gutandikira mu kizimbe okubera ngo bo muntu yale sewo etala obo muntu yale sewo oba masenyalaze gategekebwa bubi ebyo bintu bibiri so tukakaza anti ebyo bigenda okunonyereze bwako omuliro gwavu de kuchi kati okubanga furo kubanga obukulembeze bwa division twagala okwetanga tugamba twagala tubere shua tubere beka kafu ku buli somero elisuza abana akasemba yo meya mu division jo twala emoto kazi ne zikirizo omuliro ziri mu meka era zikirizo muliro kuno kubaka kutte kama je akasemba yo meya emoto ka mu division jo twala emoto kazi Mwaka ya wa Kawempe Division ayanga atwale kitundu kino wa isimwe tuli Emmanuel Serunjoji amanyidwa ngo we dembe of course ayageza ko kubanga nyonyola abantu ku biti bya labye munda kubanga bazadde ne banama uli tonaba kubanga bakirizibwa okubanga bayinge balonda mwa bazadde batono nnyo bazadde nga 10 agwe muna falaba Spark TV na NTV kimanyenti wanoko Bilal Islamic Secondary School ewa ise ewa kutomulira kusanga ssatu kisule kya senior abana abayizi abali mu senior isoka ne senior yo bibadde bali mu misomo eje ekiro ati babadde mu dormitory ekitegeeza ekikakasiza anti dala ti wali mu yizi ya ya filide mu muliro guno adofuna bisago wabula nga byo nga bo demeya banyonyola ebintu nga ebitabo emifaliso ne bila bibakozesa mabafu byo byawedewo kasera kano police anaba kulira somero mu ndawo bachi agenda maso no kuwege yage yamu no kachi ache bageza kulaba nga bakola mamo no ne yeyo mukuba zadde ababadde nga bagandu bachi agenda Mwini Mwini. Abazadde na wakulia sumerino wana 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 w
kupatidwako ensongeno. Back to you in the studios. Thank you very much, Stephen Mbide, for bringing us, uh, us up to speed with the latest details surrounding the inferno that gutted Bilal Islamic Primary and Secondary School in that regard. It's really a somber mood at these premises where the dormitory section was gutted by that fire at 9.30 p.m. that is last night during the wee hours, but no life was lost. That is the good news, but property worth millions of shillings has been lost during the inferno in that regard. Electrical wires have been actually hinted as one of the um, uh, reasons uh, for the accident in that regard. Many of the schools were never given money after the two-year two closure of schools to actually resuscitate the maintenance of their buildings, replacing old wire cables with new ones. Many did not do that. That's why you're seeing many of the dormitory sections being gutted by fires left, right and center. Good Times Infant School in Kawala also saw one learner being killed during an inferno. We shall keep tabs on those stories to bring you more details in our subsequent uh, news platform forms in that regard. That is NTV at 1, Akawungez, and also NTV tonight. For now, that's it for this edition of Morning at NTV. Russia and Ukraine invasion is still on. It's only a halted ground inv uh, offensive in that regard. They did not call for a truce. We also do know that 4,300 Russians are so far dead. 198 Ukrainians are also dead, 64 of whom are civilians, three of whom are children. Have yourselves a blessed morning. Let's encounter tomorrow same time. Easily buy, sell, send, and receive Bitcoin. Easily convert digital assets to Ugandan shillings. Quickly send money across Africa. Sign up and verify in seconds. Use the promo code NTV and get 10,000 shillings worth of Bitcoin. Introducing the ITEL A58. Get yourself one from any ITEL or MTN outlet. ITEL A58. More than bigger. Thank you for being back here. We are still continuing with our conversation. Earlier on, we were talking about telltale signs of using, a, um, you know, transitioning our children from using diapers, how to know that they are ready. And there was so much to learn. So if you haven't watched that episode, first start there, then you, you come back to this one. So let's go to when a parent should worry, because I think there are some parents who stretch this thing to, uh, they will learn eventually. At what age? Or at what point should a parent worry that maybe they need help or that the method they're employing is not working? Mm -hmm. If your child is, has absolutely no control and they can't tell mm -hmm. that they've peed or they've pooped, like they, you know, there's, there's yeah. What does they, that mean? They it's a medical problem now. Along their business yes. It's now a medical to... problem. They don't have okay. control over that muscle. If your child can communicate. Yes. And let's say they've learned poo and pee, mm. and they are not doing it. Mm. They, it's probably defi. I don't know. I don't want to say it's defiance, but there's something wrong with how you're doing it. Yeah, um, yeah there's a problem. Another thing that I found helped me so much was the praise. You have to heap praise. Yay. You have to sing. I got the entire household to do a song and dance when he actually managed to go. It was yes. like a full production. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So it had to be a whole thing, and he got so into it. Mm. And then, then there was the, the, the reward after mm. things went well. And let me tell you about men. Uh, uh, boys, actually, tell it's something I know about boys us. and men. Tell us. A woman, you or a mother, you can tell a boy something yes. 20 times, mm. he will not do it. Yeah, that's Very true. Random border guy just stands up to pee in the bush. Your son will do it. Yeah. Immediately. Yeah. Yeah. And me, that's what happened to Teja. The gatekeeper just went. Yes. Actually, I think the gatekeeper put, he trained my kid. Mm. The gatekeeper would just go, there was a colour and yeah. they, you know, he would just enter, he wouldn't close yeah. down, whatever. Yeah. And if I found my son, Bernard, who could have fallen in a thing? In a, like someone you're insisting, you go on the potty, do on the thing, and no, I found him peeing then, the lottery. Wow. Yeah. 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 yeah, and he was like just over two years, yeah. maybe. Yeah. And he would, because he had seen a man do it. he had seen it. a man do it, yeah. and he knows that that person That's is like, like me. me. This yeah. woman who is... <laughs> No, no, that's what is not she saying. That, that, no, what no, is no, it's not dating. Yeah. So yeah, again, as you do, single women, single moms, mm. put your children in the company of men mm. around just to you teach them the basics, the foundation, mm. and then let them let, let them see how they are fellow mm. gender. Yes, that's true. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. true. So 
let's start this discussion. <laughs> Let us start there. What really is the reason for the increasing number of single mothers in Uganda today? Wow. When you say what is the reason? What are your views on that? There are that? many, like yeah. there are quite a number. Mm. But I'll start with one that I feel like is the, like for me, it's what I've seen with the, the, the people that I see around me. Yeah. Husbands have forgotten their primary role. All like, right. I, I can't stress this enough. Mm. Like, I don't know if it's the parents that have not done a good job raising these husbands to be the best fathers they can be for their yeah, children. Yes. The men are so lazy. They want <laughs> to sleep all day. I thought we were going to sugarcoat this. <laughs> they are so lazy. Like, <laughs> lately, I don't know why. I, there's no sugarcoat in the <laughs> Like, we are so done. Yeah. Many of our friends are really struggling, raising yes. their children this alone. Is it is this is so... Like it is, it's not cool. Yeah. No, it's These guys cool. want to sleep all day <laughs> and let the women do their yeah. job. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it's because w we've not done. I feel like we can do better as parents. I feel like it started from home. So I think there is a two-way street. I hardly, I don't think that men became worse, to be honest. Oh. I think that me, women just got better. Mm. Oh. I think women just stopped taking shit. Mm. Like, yeah. they stopped that gumari nonsense. Mm. Yeah. But yeah. it's not that, yeah. I, I don't yeah. think men j changed the way they behaved. Mm. It's yeah. just that women stopped being content with the way with bad life. And maybe it was not so much bad life, but the fact that we are all now moving towards um, dual partnership. Yeah. Because before where the roles were defined, yes, mama, mother does this, nurtures exactly. the children, father, father provides, provides yes. usually financially. The reason my heart goes out to single moms, especially when I hear from them that they are tired emotionally, physically, and, and financially, is that even me in my home where I know I have support, I get tired, yeah. you know. And yeah. so I can imagine a mom, you know, you've gotten back home, you have to work, please not, to make ends meet because yeah. there's no support coming in. And then raise and then your you children. And then you have to raise your children, be a good parent. Some of them are just going through a heartbreak, which is something we can talk about on another day. Yeah. Because parenting while going through a heartbreak is a it's whole other dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and having to go through all of that stuff without support, yeah. I can't I can't imagine it. Yeah. And so my heart breaks for single moms in, in mm. parenting is hard work. Mm. Parenting yeah. alone yeah. is even harder. Mm -hmm. But don't let your circumstances deter you from the path that mm -hmm. you have set out for your children. Yeah. You can raise successful children even as a single parent. Yeah. When we come back, mm. we are going to be speaking to a lady mm. who lost her husband and inadvertently was forced to raise four children no. by herself. Yeah. You don't want to miss this. No. Nope. Until next time, with love from Bangla.